Here are three short Reddit stories to relax to. I hope y'all enjoy the stories and the relaxing music. If you do, please like, comment, and subscribe. Castle of Clouds There was once a magical land long, long ago, far beyond the reach of ordinary men, a land of beautiful lush green grass, soft cotton clouds, and a clear blue sky, undiscovered, untouched by anyone. There came a wandering young man, dressed in white, and in the hopes of finding the love of his life. The young wanderer saw this beautiful paradise and wanted to make it his home. But he had a task at hand, a grand task of finding the love of his life. And so, he left it in search of his love. And while wandering, he found this beautiful girl, the girl had green eyes just like the lush green grassland, skin as pale as the clouds itself. And her smile reminded him of the breeze of the paradise. At last, he thought, I've found the girl of my dreams. He found this beautiful girl all alone in a filthy swamp and wanted to take her to the paradise and give her the beautiful life that she deserved. The young man fell in love. He wanted to give her all she asked for and more. She asked to be a queen. A queen of a large kingdom, ruling over thousands of people. He looked at her, smiled and said yes, my queen. He took her to the paradise that he discovered. The girl was in awe of this breathtaking place and wanted to live there forever. The young man was delighted to hear this. But he also knew that the girl asked to be the queen of a large kingdom. And so, he wanted to build a castle. He was a capable young man, he wanted to keep her happy at any cost. But then, he didn't want to build a castle of bricks and stones. He wanted to build something special. And so, he thought and thought for days together and came across a brilliant idea. Why don't I build a castle of clouds? He started building a castle of the clouds. He told this to the beautiful girl and she approved of his idea. The girl requested some things that she wanted in the castle, she wanted a big throne room, a big bedroom, and a big bathtub. The young wanderer smiled gently and said yes, my queen. And thus, the young man started building a castle of clouds. He put his heart and mind, soul, and body, sweat and tears into building the castle of his dreams. And finally, there stood a white castle of the clouds, magnificent and majestic. There was no such thing anywhere in the whole wide world. He made the girl the queen of the castle and gave her everything she ever asked for. She was happy and ordered him around as his queen. While the young man was happy to do whatever she ordered him to do. He just wanted to see her smile and nothing else. And in this process, he fell in love with her truly, madly, deeply. And she did too. After a few years, the girl became a lady, a lady worthy to be called a queen. She was happy in the castle of clouds, but she thought that she deserved more. And so, she said to the man I don't want to be here anymore. I want to be a real queen. I want to marry a real king. I want to rule a real castle, made of bricks and stones. This broke the man's heart. He begged and begged her to not leave him, and told her that he would make it better. He just needed a bit of time to figure out what she was missing in his castle. She said that this castle wasn't real. It was made of clouds. And the real castles are made of bricks and stones and don't float in the clouds. To him, the castle was as good as the real castle. He had put a lot of work and thought into building the castle. He had put in his dreams, his heart, and his soul into building the castle of clouds. All his efforts were futile. He was left in vain. She left him all alone in search of a better future. Years passed, and the young man grew slightly older, he didn't know what he would do after she left him. She was everything that he had ever asked for. She was everything that all that he ever wanted. He thought and thought but never could understand what more could he have done to make things back to the way it was. He gave her all his love, all his care, and did all he could do to make her feel like the queen. He was left broken. And so, he sat under the blazing sun, day after day, every day, and grew weak. He started to look smaller, his broad stature had now become feeble. His bones were showing, his hair and beard grew longer, his radiant skin became dull and brittle, and his eyes had lost their shine, waiting for her to come back to him. The majestic castle he built, started showing cracks, and the roof of the castle was falling. Without proper maintenance and care, the walls made of clouds fell. A once beautiful castle started collapsing in front of him. And all he did was watch. Watch the castle walls fall, collapse, and crumble to dust. There was no meaning to rebuild it without a queen. He now had nothing. The weather soon turned bad. The lush green grass started dying and the land became barren. There was no sign of the castle anywhere. The clouds turned gray and the clear blue sky was nowhere to be seen. The only thing he had in himself were the broken pieces of his heart. Nor did he have the will to find another queen or another paradise. He started to wander again. He saw many other beautiful women. He came across many other paradises. He now had nothing to do with them. He was scared to give his heart to someone else. He was scared that they'd break it again. He was afraid to build another castle because there was no point in building it anymore. He wondered if he could ever find her again. If he could ever fall in love with anyone else. If he could ever fix his broken heart. If he could ever build another castle full of love and dreams. He wondered and wandered into the horizon until forever. And never to be seen again. The Virtuoso. The crowd parted for me as I strode from the alleyway into the town square. My filigent cloak flapping behind me. 
It was my first excursion to the eastern border of the marches. The air was slick with dew and although I've overheard some complain in passing about how it clings to the skin like steam, I personally find within the sensation a nostalgic sort of comfort. Although none here would have likely seen me before, certainly whisperings of the legends would reach even this remote intersection of the world, and voiceless lips along with motions gone yet unseen confirmed this. I spotted a young boy near the repurposed scaffold brought out for this visit of peculiar significance and decided to single him out during the performance. This was among my usual repertoire of small deceptions to make the performance more significant. I skimmed the surface of the steps in what I knew appeared as a single motion executed with perfect fluidity. It was in this way that my entrance to this performance, which was of course to be as significant as my last, but not any more so, would come to mirror the abrupt and sudden egress to everything I loved. Perhaps half a watch or less into the performance, which had been going very well up to that point. I spotted a man clad in white armor that seemed to blaze phosphorescent in the afternoon sun, as he began to approach from where he had stood against one of the pillars of a building that lined the square. The square, which was not really so much a square as a half-octagon lined with dilapidated shacks stacked upon one another. Among these makeshift shelters and storefronts pocked alleyways and roads that appeared to dart off at random, to the behest of some unseen and unthinking god. It was after I had pulled the boy up to the wooden foundation, and performed some simple tricks to help the day appear more significant within his mind, that the white-clad man unbuttoned his helm and challenged the validity of the performance. Looking back, I must admit that my immediate rage was likely spurred on by my passion and love for the art of the performance. I see now in memory how my grip tightened on the boy's shoulder as the man climbed upon the pulpit, and how the eyes of the spectators turned dark in response to the pain in his face. He proposed a series of three trials, the first proved to be trivial, and I will not recount it here. The second I found slightly more difficult, and I was forced to conjure a series of animals from the audience to appease his request. He then proposed, I think with some amusement, that I warp the boy onto a drooping railing above the struggling dentist's workshop. This, I knew, was still somewhat beyond my capabilities. But I felt within myself the overwhelming need to prove to this stranger, to the crowd weeping and moaning as they were, to myself that I could overcome his accusations. I felt a desire to prove the worth of my guild, and the value of the performance that overwhelmed my sense of reason. The looks of horror and anguished cries from the crowd did not escape me, but none of them encroached upon us, knowing that they held no sway in the events to come. I positioned my hands upon the boy in the way I had seen done before, and softly chanted the incantation in the way of the untrained or unprepared. Although I could not see the man, nor anything else as I held my eyes firmly closed in focus, I felt in some deep recess of the soul that he was grinning inwardly with a depraved thrill. The final rune stumbled clumsily from my mouth and my eyes snapped open to see the boy pop out of existence, appear upon the designated banister, and then vanish once more. He then, as we all watched in some abject horror, besides perhaps the armored man nearby me, though I know not of his reaction as he was not within my sight, appeared once more before me and let out a small, panicked cry that quickly reduced into a gurgle as the bottom half of his corpse materialized a final time upon the balustrade and crumpled into a wet pile. The half-boy gurgled and spasmed once more before laying as still as the crowd and myself. The only movement on the scaffolding was to be the gushing of his blood that pooled above the cracks in the wood, and the slow steps of the man in white approaching me. You have failed Agilus, this test is over. His voice had shifted to a distinctly authoritarian tone that immediately betrayed the meaning behind his words. I was too dumbfounded by the realization that my own guild could have done such a thing to properly react to the hand motion that precipitated an alteration in my perspective. Now I was level with the man's eyes. I could see the distinct regal haze that adorned the pupils we once shared and I wondered how I had not noticed it beforehand. How I had not understood his purpose from the moment I laid eyes upon him. We ascended, and he clutched my ankle to suspend me in the open air. Tell me Agilus, with all of your powers, can you save yourself? No, master. Who can? You, master. Only me? Only you. He smiled at my words, and we descended back to the pulpit. Agilus, because you have responded with humility, your punishment will be less severe. He again flicked his hand with a perfect fluidity as he spoke, and I felt all the joy and beauty in the world drain from my being. When I rose again the man was gone, and the crowd parted once more before me as I stumbled from their township. This was based on a writing prompt that me and my friends did together for fun. We had a strict 1000 word limit so I tried to fit as much in as I can. P.S. That is a direct pull from Gene Wolfe as I just read Book of the New Sun and like I said this was just for fun. He in the Sahara. The sands of the Sahara stirred under the hot noonday sun. To an observer, this would not have seemed unusual, given that sometimes the sand so moved, when the winds blew. But today the winds were dead, rendering earth unnaturally still. What propelled each grain of sand was not external but internal, a tiny solar engine whose battery had finally been fully charged. Each grain of Saharan sand, a barely perceptible spacecraft, piloted by a member of a race called the Dry People, whose ancestors had arrived on Earth, as on many other planets, a long, long time ago. Who knows? Not me.
Their spacecraft had lain dormant and charging for millions of years. They had, desiccated, existed for ages. Some say they traveled around the universe on rays of light. Others, by some unknown quirk of quantum mechanics. Today, as the engines of their spacecraft switched fatefully on, they were each roused from their dehydrated slumber by the release of a single drop of moisture. Into them, water entered. Their spacecraft rose and flowed. Murmurated. Like starlings at dusk. Imagine it, the entirety of the Sahara Desert, every last seemingly insignificant particle of sand, ascending, until the land below lies as uncovered as a table from whose surface the tablecloth has been pulled. Like magic. Except here there is no magician, no devilish sleight of hand. Only the self-propelling sands organizing themselves into four flocks, one for each cardinal direction. The north flock blankets the Maghreb, before crossing the Mediterranean and enveloping Europe. The south flock spreads to the Cape of Good Hope. The east flock smothers India, incorporates the Gobi and befalls the rest of Asia. The west flock, what a magnificently apocalyptic sight it is, soaring over the Atlantic toward the Americas, both of which it shall, too, in arid constellations, manifestly destinate. Doom from above. Water-based humanity caught by surprise. The last days of our special lives. We are a victim, plastic bag thrust over our heads, breathing what scraps of air remain. Existence struggling without hope. The plastic bag going in, out, in, out. The lips turning grayish blue. The dry people pilot their innumerable spacecraft over our continents, countries, cities, shrouding them, penetrating us, into our ears and down our throats, assaulting our eyes and invading our insides. Some of us they kill. Others they hijack, turning human against human, or forcing us to work toward their ends, cataloging and collecting dunes and beaches, laboring in the crush quarries. I never lost control. Our decimated species prepares more spacecraft for them. More dry people arrive, riding starlight or washed upon our earthen shores by probability waves. The sands proliferate and conquer. Earth becomes a planet only of desert and ocean, and environmental in young. It is in one of the crush quarries, sweat-soaked and burning, exposed under the unforgiving sun, that you see him. He is drinking tea in a shadow cast by an umbrella. You're face to face. You lift your pickaxe and let it fall. With the man who sold the world. If you enjoyed these stories, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment your favorite story below. Thanks for watching.